The most unprecedented act of Jujutsu violence in history. The culling game is a ritual that requires sorcerers of all ages and from many different time periods to fight each other and evolve. The culling game arc of Jujutsu Kaisen is home to some of the most interesting and powerful characters in the series to date. In this video, I want to rank every single character in the culling game that was introduced in this arc from weakest to strongest, and we'll be dissecting everyone's physical strengths their curse techniques, overall stats, and their weaknesses as well, in order to justify where they place in the rankings. If this all sounds interesting to you, please feel free to click the like button and subscribe if you want to see even more content like this. We're gonna get right into it, but most importantly, thank you for watching. Rin Amai is the awakened sorcerer that Kenjaku is talking about specifically when it comes to not being interesting. A young teenager marked by Kenjaku and engraved with a curse technique despite originally being a non-sorcerer, Rin, for lack of a better word, is a coward. His role in the culling game is immediately falling into dirty work for two curse users looking to prey on newly entering players. Rin alerts the two players named Haba and Hanyu whenever someone gets teleported into to the colony, allowing them to take advantage of the confusion and net some easy points. This harks all the way back to Rin's civilian life, where he happily reaped the benefits of associating with bullies, despite overall not relating to them or fitting in. He's the type of person who would rather go with the flow and follow the leader than make any real decisions, which Rin flat out tells Yuji essentially when he admits he's too afraid to join the fight against Sakuna. Thankfully though, Rin was in the right place and right time to catch Hanukkah Karusu from falling after taking critical damage from the King of Curses. Angel implies Rin used his curse technique to stop the fall, but it's never elaborated what that ability might be. Rin also gives the correct information to Itadori about where Higuruma is hiding when they're hunting for his 100 points at the start of the arc, so he's at least better than some people on this list. Speaking of which, another follower type character, Remy is essentially the honeypot of Reggie Star's culling game operation. As a member of Reggie's gang, Remy specializes in using her looks and beauty to rope in unsuspecting or weak players and trick them into an ambush to steal points. Much like Rin Amai, as a normal person before being converted into a sorcerer, Remy wasn't very proactive in decision making. She's always been able to get by on her good looks and allowing charming, more powerful powerful men to handle her business for her. Although, using her own words, these men usually turn out to be quote unquote wolves. It does, frankly, make her life easy enough to get by. This is why she lets herself be manipulated by Reggie, despite even Megami being able to figure out the obvious truth that he's just using her for points. And even after this does turn out to be true, and Remy's discarded by Reggie when she's considered useless, Remy still chooses to stick by his side and fight back against Megami. Her curse technique seems to revolve around manipulating the cursed energy in the strands of her hair to become a weapon, almost resembling a scorpion's tail. Although the damage capability seems to be pretty minuscule, as it doesn't do much to Megami despite hitting him point blank. Frankly, she's only given a rank because she's a genuine character as opposed to Oro lookalike, and she's only higher than Rin because we actually know what her curse technique is. One of the curse users taking advantage of Rin Amai and rookie culling game players by sniping them out of the sky in the middle of their disorientation from being teleported inside the barrier. Hanyu does this thanks to her curse technique, again, for some reason, revolving around her hair, shape-shifting those long locks and solidifying it into what looks like a jet engine. With these new jet engine extensions, Hanyu is able to reach high velocity speeds and dart through the air at unsuspecting players from afar. If hit at the right angle, she can slam an opponent into a building and cause severe damage to both the person and property. However, a major downside of this technique, whether it's because of the conditions or plain inexperience, all the cursed energy flowing through her hair removes the reinforcement from the rest of her body, making her very weak and susceptible to attack if she isn't maintaining her high speed. This is proven when Hanyu's dispatched by Itadori Yuji simply by throwing a cursed energy infused rock into her side, which causes her to fall and get knocked unconscious. 
Lots of hair-related techniques in these fodder awakened sorcerers, huh? Haba is Hanyu's boyfriend and partner in crime, who instead of turning his hair into a jet engine, Haba chose a propeller. Like a helicopter, Haba spins this propeller rapidly in order to achieve flight and quick agility. What makes Haba much more confident in his abilities than Hanyu is his boasting that his propellers are strong enough to slash through steel. He can adjust the level of size and toughness of these blades as well. However, Haba lacks any real strategy or battle IQ whatsoever to make good use of this, and is immediately dispatched by sorcerers with any real experience in fighting, such as Yuji. At some point later, Haba runs into the US military soldiers invading the culling game colonies, and he stated to survive the platoon's tasers, grenades, etc., and even ends up injuring multiple soldiers before they ultimately kill him in action. So I guess, rest in peace, propeller hat guy, your sense of fashion will not be missed. Chizuru is a member of Reggie Star's gang of players. Chizuru doesn't have much screen time, but from what we know about him, he was at the very least able to acquire 28 points in the culling game. Although that point count implies not all of the points are from sorcerers, considering it's impossible to reach that number from multiples of five. Whether he was a recruited awakened sorcerer or someone who followed Reggie from the past, Chizuru's ultimate contribution was ambushing unsuspecting players with the rest of his gang after Remy effectively deceives them. As when it came to close quarters combat, Chizuru was dispatched pretty quickly by a teenage sorcerer on two different occasions. Once head on, and even another time when he took Megami by surprise. His curse technique seemed to revolve around his ability to sharpen his fingers into jet black claws for increased damage, although that appears to literally be his only ability, but Reggie does hint Chizuru died before being able to utilize the full ability of his technique what is assumed to be a reincarnated culling game player. Rokujushi Miyo is defined as a character by his deep infatuation with any and all things sumo. It can only be assumed if he had any reasons for following Kenjaku hundreds of years into the future, it was because Miyo was promised there would be plenty of people taking part that he could sumo. The time period that Miyo was from, it wasn't considered frowned upon to run around and challenge random civilians to wrestling matches. So his psychotic actions are more in response to his regret of having more sumo opponents in the past than the era he finds himself locked in. Despite Mio's apparent ignorance in the face of anything having to do with not sumo, when in the ring and truly in his element, Mio becomes an almost graceful, intelligent man who speaks in poetic monologues. When noticing Maki Zenin's head was clouded and it was affecting her ability to fight at full strength, Mio immediately picks up on this and knows exactly how to work out Maki's tension. When it comes to actual combat, Despite being an exceptional wrestler and quite knowledgeable in the realm of sumo, Mio is ultimately outclassed in most situations Jujutsu Kaisen presents to him. He is clearly a strong force to be reckoned with in the physical department, considering he was able to overwhelm and defeat an awakened Maki Zenin in multiple rounds of wrestling. Although in a real battle where hands are thrown, this gap in their skills begins to widen considerably. When attacking with a full force headbutt, Mio caused minimal damage to a cursed spirit Naoya and would have fallen victim to Naoya's domain expansion had Maki not stepped in to save him. Mio doesn't appear to have a curse technique either, and if he does, he hasn't utilized it. He is able to conjure a simple domain, although its conditions rely entirely around sumo. In fact, the barrier is made upon strict consensual acceptance of all involved in order to completely ignore any binding vows or jujutsu stipulations in general. It literally is a simple domain stripped down to its barest bones, made just for two sumo wrestlers who want to be there. Time dilates and does not pass inside the domain in order to ensure the combatants can sumo for all eternity, or at least until they're done. For this reason, and all the other areas that Mio lacks, he sits very low on the ranking. Much like Rokujushi Mio, Hagane Daido is a man who somehow found himself traveling through time as a reincarnated player in the culling game. Only, instead of sumo, Daido's obsession revolves around katanas, which, I won't lie, is 10 times cooler and much more relatable. Similar to Mio, unlike the past eras of Japan, you can't just open carry a sword in public, and katanas are not as readily available as they once were when samurais and shoguns wandered the earth, a fact that brings Daido to tears. More 
More importantly though, the big difference between Dido and Mio, besides their adoration of choice, is that it seems Dido actually has no cursed energy whatsoever, or at least no more than the average human, as he is unable to see cursed spirits. However, once Dido does have a sword in his hand, everything becomes much clearer, as even without a technique or potential as a sorcerer, Dido's aura alone when holding a blade is enough for three experienced warriors, Kamo Noritoshi, Maki, and Naoya Zen Zenin to tremble from the sheer lethality, slicing vengeful spirit Naoya down the middle, despite not being able to see his location at all. This is due in part to Maki's soul-splitting blade that ignores durability and strikes an opponent's spirit directly, but it's also because Dido's lack of cursed energy is supplemented by what he calls seeing everything besides what he can't see, implying he uses subtle shifts in the environment or air disturbances to pinpoint a curse's location rather than just eyesight alone, only further justifying his inclusion as a culling game player and depicting how he may have fought sorcerers in the past. Hagane Dido is clearly a force of nature when it comes to regular melee. At the end of the day though, no matter how scary he is with a katana, if it's not Maki's soul splitting blade and he's up against someone with any actual jujutsu, it's over. Charles Bernard is a newly awakened sorcerer taking part in the culling game, and potentially Gege Akutami's self-insert. I'll leave my headcanon out of this one, but Charles is deeply obsessed with manga, to the point he can't go a single conversation without quoting one, or comparing the current situation he's in to a comic book he's already read. Charles wants nothing more than to be an established mangaka, and has spent numerous years trying to perfect that craft, despite never once drafting a manga or having one of his series published. We're introduced to his character trying to take advantage of Japan's crumbling infrastructure and hoping he can score a shot in weekly jump since most popular mangaka are refusing to work during the national emergency. Charles is ultimately a very selfish and introverted person, only being pushed to the point of anger if his work or art is criticized. He is pretty passive in the culling game, despite awakening to a decently powerful curse technique. Charles' innate technique is called what I assume to be self-named G War Staff. Stemming from the title of the curse tool, his ability directly revolves around. Charles can summon this weapon from thin air, which resembles a long spear with a pen at its tip. He's quite proficient at using it, regardless of his short amount of time in the culling game. It's unknown if Charles had any other battles besides Akari, but he did seem to have a basic enough understanding of cursed energy, enough to reinforce his body in order to defend and attack while fighting Hakari. This spear work and fighting style was surprisingly able to make Akari exert effort, but this is actually actually because of the secondary effect of Charles' ability. G War Staff, after taking in blood from an opponent, converts that blood into ink. And with that ink, Charles is able to draw and conjure a physical manga panel onto his enemy. By seeing into this quote unquote panel, Charles is able to look into the future for one second to start with. More blood equals more ink, which translates into more panels and more seconds added to Charles' precognition. This future sight, although not increasing any of Charles' physical stats or capabilities does significantly improve his reaction time and ability to strategize, which is what would allow such a low level, new and developing sorcerer to compete even somewhat closely to a high tier threat like Kinji Hikari, as even with just two seconds, Charles was offering some minuscule amount of threat. With more time added to G War Staff, Charles can become quite dangerous. Combined with the small amount of cursed energy reinforcement he is capable of, Charles should at least be able to fend off anyone on the list below him what could be considered Reggie's right-hand man in their gang of sorcerers. Hazanoki Iori is another sorcerer who has been reincarnated from a previous era, although it's unclear from which one. It can be assumed he predates any societies with a modern social contract, as Hazanoki's violent nature and willingness to participate in the culling game implies he's from a much more primitive time. This can also be inferred by his exceptionally high level when it comes to Jujutsu, as not only is Hazanoki capable of cursed energy manipulation, population at a very efficient rate. He was able to last for a decent amount of time in a battle against Fumihiko Takaba, a much higher ranked player, and show little to no signs of stamina loss. His top tier endurance does a lot of favors for Hazanoki when it comes to his cursed technique. His innate technique, Explosive Flesh, allows him to turn any limb or organ of his own body into a bomb. And with his massive reserve of curse energy bestowing Hazanoki with reverse curse technique at quite the advanced level, he can 
repeatedly remove parts of himself and use them as attacks without worries. In battle, Hazanoki primarily uses his teeth or eyeballs as a main source of projectiles, proving the reincarnated player either has a good pain tolerance or plenty of experience doing this kind of thing. And although Hazanoki isn't able to produce a domain expansion or able to put up much of a fight against Kenjaku's Cursed Spirit manipulation, his skill in Sorcerer Battle was enough to net him 35 points. And when the US Army invaded the Culling Game colonies, Hazanoki was one of the sorcerers capable enough to avoid capture and take out a couple soldiers on his own. Besides that basic rundown, Hazanoki doesn't have much else to him. He's a pretty powerful sorcerer, at least grade 1 level at best, thanks to what I assume is years of previous experience. His reverse curse technique is impressive, but he lacks any devastating moves or abilities to turn the tables against other players. It's unknown what he joined the culling game for, and whether he met up with Reggie before or after the ritual began. It doesn't seem like Hazanoki has any serious goals, as once Reggie perishes, he wanders aimlessly until he's eliminated by Kenjaku. He does, however, share a family name with Utahime Iori, although there's little resemblance between the two in either looks or innate technique. And finally, we get to the ringleader of the Tokyo Colony 1 Curse User Gang. Another player of the culling game who was reincarnated from the past, and someone who at least shared a bit more than an acquaintanceship with Kenjaku before he was turned into a cursed object. Based on Registar's knowledge of the inner workings of the culling game and spot-on predictions he is able to make about the future of its ritual, Megami assumes the con man was closer to Kenjaku than most, and it's easy to see how the two would have gotten along, as Registar is quite the manipulative villain himself. Within only a couple of days, Reggie was able to set himself up in Tokyo Colony 1 and truly thrive in the chaos and discourse the culling game created. Despite claiming to care deeply about his subordinates, Reggie treats them all as if they're disposable the moment they're no longer useful to him. His main plot throughout the first stage of the culling game is to amass as many points as possible, whether that be by killing those he traps through Remy's honeypot or recruiting stronger allies sympathetic to his cause to pool his points with. Just like other reincarnated players who know Kenjaku personally, similar to Uro Takako who we'll discuss later, Reggie's ultimate goal lies in hoarding points like wealth in preparation for whatever quote unquote bomb Kenjaku plans to drop in the latter half of the ritual. As the leader of his gang of delinquents, Reggie Star uses his exceptional intellect and tact just as well in battle as he does in deceiving others. Not only is he the most knowledgeable in Jujutsu so far on this list, capable of of things like anti-domain measures with hollow wicker basket, or efficient enough cursed energy manipulation to walk on what might as well be water, or withstand Max Elephant's weight. Reggie's talent for strategy goes well with his innate technique, called contract recreation. By burning a contract, be it either a receipt, bill of sale, etc., whatever is appropriate for the time, Reggie is able to bring whatever was written or sold on the contract into reality. This ability has almost no limits, and isn't bound by the concept concept of physical objects either, shown when Reggie uses his curse technique to quote unquote recreate a two day spa trip that replenishes him in stamina and health. This technique is great for all around offense or defense, allowing Reggie to conjure things like knives to full on Mack trucks. Combined with his battle IQ, this makes Reggie very dangerous. And with most of his entire clothing attire made out of receipts, unless he's hit with water or forced to burn them all at once, Reggie has a nigh unlimited resource of a variety variety of items. These objects can also surprisingly be given commands as if they were shikigami, meaning summon knives can change direction mid-air, or items can be hidden inside other items for counter slash sneak attacks. Coming from an era where violence was necessary for survival, Reggie is very exceptional at merging these contracts into his fighting style. On top of the fact, Reggie is also quite skilled in close quarters combat, able to hold his own against a 120% Chimera Shadow Garden activated mega Megami Fushigoro. Despite being a high grade 1 sorcerer, his lack of a domain expansion or maximum technique really hold him back, on top of glaring vulnerabilities like removing his source of receipts with water or fire. He doesn't seem to have reverse curse technique either, being a huge part of the reason a modern age teenager like Megami was able to defeat him in a battle of trickery and deceit.
One of the only 16 special grade curse spears to be registered by Jujutsu Society. The immense fear and negative energy humanity had towards cockroaches amassed into an entity as powerful as Kurorushi, which, understandable. At some point, Kurorushi was defeated by Kenjaku and stored by curse spirit manipulation to be released into the culling game later as a player. Despite being a special grade curse, Kurorushi does seem to lack the same kind of intelligence found in the disaster curses purely living off of its own instinct to devour humans and its love for the taste of iron. That's not to say Kurorushi isn't an intelligent being, as it was still able to completely understand the objective of the culling game and acquire a total of 52 points before deciding to lie dormant when realizing Dhruv Lakdwala would be a bad matchup for it. Kurorushi lied in slumber, choosing self-preservation over its hunger for the time being, showing it, at the very least, isn't mindless. It also displays some amount of communication, asking Okotsu Yuta why the sorcerer interferes with its feast on humans. Kurorushi's brain is definitely superior to the grasshopper curse when it comes to battle as well, having a considerable ability in Jujutsu. Although lacking a domain expansion for all intents and purposes, the special grade curse Kurorushi possesses a massive reserve of cursed energy, to the point it is able to conjure entire storms or hurricanes of cockroaches from thin air. As long as Kurorushi devours flesh, its Parthen Genesis continually flourishes, birthing more and more roaches for Kurorushi to control. Each individual insect has enough power to kill a man, and when they amass like torrents of waves, they can pick a human apart in seconds. The cursed energy reinforcement behind them is enough to make special grade sorcerer Yuta Okotsu concerned with their striking force, and considering Kurorushi can orchestrate them in a variety of ways, this innate technique is dangerous enough alone. But on top of its horde of roaches, Kurorushi is also able to summon other forms of bug Shikigami that can blind opponents, or by using its signature curse tool, the Festering Life Sword, Kurorushi can invade opponents' bodies with parasites that tear from the wound's entry point and cause even more damage. All of this power was enough to bring down a special grade sorcerer like Yuta, who, in his defense, was limiting himself by not wanting to reveal any of his techniques to the other players watching his fight, and what makes Kurorushi all the more terrifying is that even if you are able to take down a special grade curse with all of that going for it, Kurorushi's Parthenogenesis allows the cockroach to completely revive itself through one of its children. By feasting on enough human flesh, to the point instead of just regular cockroaches and cursed energy, the curse produces an entirely new body. This quote-unquote child will lie dormant until the parent Kurorushi is vanquished, at which point all of the curse's power and essence will transfer to the child. This new Kurorushi is a effectively a brand new being entirely, without memories of the previous Kurorushi, Kurorushi does fall short of the disaster curse's impact, but still remains a terrifying threat in the culling game that would be a problem for really anybody that can't effectively deal with the swarm and Kurorushi at the same time. The first reincarnated player of the culling game to come straight from the Heian era with the other villains. Oro Takako is one of the highest scoring sorcerers in the game, and one of the four major pillars of power that locks Sendai Colony into a stalemate. In her first life, she was a well established captain of the Sun, Moon, and Stars Squad, an assassin organization employed directly by the Fujiwara clan. Although Oro was quite high in the ranks of political power, she was betrayed by the Fujiwara clan in the end, and framed for a murder she did not commit. She was stripped of her title, and after some gap in time, Oro chooses to make a vow with Kenjaku to become a cursed object and transcend time into the unknown future, figuring she had nothing left to lose. Because everything was robbed from her right before the end of her first incarnation, Oro harbors a very cold-hearted and bitter demeanor during the culling game, allowing her to easily justify the bloodshed Oro takes part in. Although, her pride as a former assassin does keep her from killing any non-sorcerers. From what little we know of the Heian era, the Sun, Moon, and Star Squad, otherwise known as the Toe, was one of the most famous gangs of elite warriors, sharing an equally violent reputation as the Five Void Generals or the Deshi Pacification Squad. Again, I can say all of that stuff, but it means very little with how in the dark we are with the Heian period. Anyway, Oro Takako's showings in the Cullen game alone are enough to justify her holding this high of a position. With the innate technique Sky Manipulation, Oro proves 
her worth as an assassin by being able to take the space itself and turn it into a tangible object. The best example given is similar to how a camera creates lens distortion. Oro can essentially use her bare hand to pull the sky into reality, allowing her to cloak herself in it and levitate through the air by manipulating the sky around herself. Oro can also control space in such a way she can distort anything that comes towards her, making her almost invincible to most physical attacks as long as she isn't caught off guard. Oro can distort a simple punch from Akotsu Yuta all the way to a full-on granite blast from Ishigori Ryu, who we'll be getting to in a moment. Oro is even able to whip the sky around in such a way she can redirect projectile attacks such as granite blast back at the sender without sacrificing any striking force or power. Oro's curse technique does have its limits, as it can't cause actual damage from its space distortion. Shown when Akotsu Yuta's stretched out arm returns to normal once it exits the manipulated area. This means Oro can't just crush an opponent by closing them inside inverted space. However, Oro has shown sky manipulation can in fact be used for offensive purposes if she quote unquote breaks the surface she herself creates. Appropriately naming that ability Thin Icebreaker. When creating a surface of sky on top of an opponent and shattering it like a thin layer of ice, Oro can rebound the force of the shockwave against the opponent and cause massive damage. Thin Icebreaker was shown to critically damage Okotsu Yuta, a special grade sorcerer with superior cursed energy reinforced defense, and launch him quite a distance away. But Oro has also used the ability on the environment to cause area of effect shockwaves as well. What puts Oro above everyone else so far is her veteran status as a sorcerer that also had the displeasure of developing in the Heian era, the golden age of Jujutsu. As a captain of a high tier squad of sorcerer assassins, Oro's cursed energy reserves are colossal, large enough at least to battle through multiple days of the culling game and take on two comparable, if not higher level opponents in Ishigori Ryu, Okotsu Yuta, and Kurorushi right after. Besides stamina, Oro does have extensive knowledge on sorcery as a whole, immediately recognizing the snake and fang marks on Yuta and attempting to block the incoming cursed speech attack she knew was coming. She was also able to withstand the beating that both Rika and Yuta gave her afterwards, as well as being more than willing to continue fighting despite her arm being torn off. Despite us never seeing it, Oro Takako also does have the ability to use domain expansion, which is actually a first for the ranking so far, and definitely counters any other argument for her placing above the people below. Ishigori Ryu is a reincarnated player from the Date period. Unlike most other players from previous eras, Ishigori Ryu found himself with little regrets in his first life. He was able to become the strongest in his area at the time and meet a good woman that he could call a wife. But what left Ishigori feeling empty inside and wanting a second chance at life was the fact he never felt like he had any dessert. Not literal dessert, but without getting fancy or poetic, Ishigori never fought to the death with an opponent of comparable strength and experienced the true thrill of battle. Because of this gaping hole in Ishigori's life, instead of dying unfulfilled, the sorcerer chose to take up Kenjaku's offer of traversing time and join the culling game in the future. Ironically enough, there was a single sorcerer in his time period that could have given him a proper fight, but we'll talk more about that later. In the 400 years since Ishigori Ryu became a cursed object, not a single sorcerer was ever able to surpass him in pure cursed energy output alone. Confirmed by Ken Jaku, Ishigori is able to muster more destructive power from straight up cursed energy blasts than literally any other person in history. Now, I'm not quite sure where he fired them from the past considering he was bald as hell back then, but in the culling game, his new incarnation uses a pompadour, the large cylinder made from his hair on top of his head as a cannon to fire these humongous beams of power. These beams can come in singular form or be split into a volley attack that's capable of causing large craters on the ground upon on impact. When fully powered up to the maximum, Ishigori Ryu unleashes what he calls Granite Blast, a hyper beam capable of demolishing multiple city blocks. The most dangerous part is Ishigori can actually release the same striking force whether his curse technique is on cooldown or not, meaning after casting Domain Expansion, which Ishigori does in fact have, although its technique is unknown and will forever remain unknown, rest in peace king, Ishigori can immediately start blasting at full power as soon as the Domain 
Sheen disperses with no need to recharge. Ishigori's attack power with this ability is powerful enough to obliterate almost half of Kurarushi's body in one blast. It also incapacitated Oro Takako, a sorcerer of nigh equal level to Ishigori, in one blast as well. What ultimately makes Ishigori such a terrifying threat is that he's able to use that output in more ways than just giant laser beams. His efficient manipulation of his massive stock of cursed energy allows his close quarters combat and durability to be on a superior level to most sorcerers, even some that rank above him. Despite listing how one attack was enough to knock out two heavy hitters instantly, Ishigori was able to take a rebounded granite blast of his own head on with little to no repercussions. He blocked a concentrated cursed energy beam from Rika Orimoto and went punch for punch with her to the point she became overwhelmed and couldn't maintain her shape. And all of this is tied into a neat little bow with Ishigori's agility and speed. In my opinion, coming out of the Battle Royale in Sendai Colony looking the best and multitasking two to three opponents with little to no complaints. Funnily enough, the thing that takes him out isn't a copied thin icebreaker or a direct attack from Yuta. It's his own damn granite blast that gets directed again. Oh, and 15 fingers Sukuna cleaved into pieces before he could even put up a fight, but we don't talk about that. Dhruv Lakdwala may be the oldest sorcerer taking part in the culling game, not including whatever timeline Kenjaku originates from. The culling game player made his debut during the Civil War of Wa, almost 2,000 years ago, where he single-handedly conquered the Japanese archipelago with his own jujutsu sorcery. It is unknown how, but at some point, Dhruv learned of a method to cheat death and reincarnated himself in another time period. It's during this era where Dhruv would meet Kenjaku and after his second lifetime, would choose to incarnate once again and take part in the violent chaos that is the culling game. And when the ritual begins, Dhruv was well within his element, gaining 91 points in total before his 2000 year reign finally ends at the hands of Okotsu Yuta, the prodigy child. Dhruv is a powerful Shikigami user and is capable of conjuring two different types of creatures with his innate technique, and a large amount of them. The smaller variety of Shikigami are pterodactyl resembling monsters that are able to attack from the skies and pick people off individually, where the larger type that look more like demonic rodents are big enough to destroy city blocks on their rampage. These Shikigami are able to be controlled remotely, and Dhruv uses them to attack civilians and sorcerers indiscriminately. Because these Shikigami have no limit of range, they can reap destruction no matter how far they move away from Dhruv. And what makes this all the more terrifying is the route these Shikigami Shikigami Follow creates an orbit with Dhruv in the center, in which this entire area constitutes his domain. In simpler terms, the Shikigami continually branch out in a circle around Dhruv, and almost as if they themselves are the barrier, they continually expand Dhruv's domain until he has conquered the entire location, making it very easy to see how one man could have crippled an entire island country with little chance of fighting back. While the Shikigami Dhruv summons are quite powerful and can appear anywhere inside of his domain to attack enemies, they can ultimately be taken down by someone equally strong and with enough crowd control options to force their way through to the source of the mayhem. Something Okotsu Yuta was clearly able to do, proving the third time at life is not the charm. It cannot be ignored though that Dhruv was strong enough on his own to completely lock Sendai Colony in a stalemate, as neither Kurarushi, Oro Takako, or Ishigori Ryu were confident enough in their abilities to even even get close to Dhruv. Ishigori himself even admits he was only able to get somewhat near the Shikigami user's location because Yuta was preoccupying him, implying, like most sorcerers, they can sense anything inside of their domain territory immediately, which just makes Dhruv even more terrifying because he can eviscerate you from miles away. This is also my justification for putting him above Ishigori because, well, if he could have beaten Dhruv, he should have just done it himself. Another reincarnated player that originates directly from the Heian era, and also, unfortunately, the cursed object that was implanted into Sumiki Fushigoro and possessed her as a vessel. Due to the nature of two souls inhabiting the same body, the invading essence almost always subjugates and overtakes the host, resulting in their death. It is, for this reason alone, it's safe to say, no matter what way events have played, the true killer of Sumiki Fushigoro is Yorozu herself. 
Yorozu, being an ancient sorcerer, is someone that's more than acquainted with Kenjaku and Arame, to the point she is actually morbidly obsessed with Ryomen Sukuna, the king of curses, and would love nothing more than to be his wife and fight by his side. Although, Sukuna, of course, does not share this sentiment. She joined the culling game in order to follow the love of her life into the future and force Sukuna to marry her. In the Heian era, Yorozu was a very famous sorcerer, acknowledged and bestowed political power by by the Fujiwara clan for stepping onto their territory and defeating their defense force, the Five Void Generals. They called Yorozu a hick behind her back, not because she was an outsider, but because she was a vulgar elite who didn't follow tradition or even wear clothes half the time. What makes Yorozu so commendable is her ability to turn a very inefficient curse technique into a very effective weapon that was able to crush some of the strongest warriors of the time. Similar to Mai Zenin in the modern age, Yorozu was born with the innate technique known as construction, an ability that, for the cost of a large amount of cursed energy, the user can conjure anything they want into reality and make it physical. In the exchange event, we see Mai Zenin use the curse technique to construct a seventh bullet for her revolver to trick enemies with. Unfortunately, this is all it's good for though, as it requires so much cursed energy it can only create one bullet per day. This debilitating price is something that Yorozu also suffers from making most of her youth revolve around researching and experimenting with different ways to make the most of this mess. Yorozu was eventually able to create any weapon or tool she had a decent enough understanding of, except cursed tools of course, which definitely upped the arsenal of objects at her disposal. And by furthering her evolution, Yorozu came to the conclusion of liquid metal, a substance that can repeatedly change its shape and volume with minimal cursed energy reinforcement, allowing Yorozu to shapeshift the different weapons she's aware of without using up new energy and just recycling the old. With this new discovery of liquid metal, Yorozu was easily able to mold different attacks or shapes mid-battle, adding multiple mid- and long-range projectiles into the mix of her already dangerous close-quarters combat. Yorozu was capable of throwing hands back and forth with a 15-finger Sukuna, something no one has ever been shown to do before. Granted, this was a Sukuna who was restricting himself from using dismantle, but impressive nonetheless. Her signature creations seem to resemble insects, which are the second source of inspiration for her construction technique. During all of her research, Yorozu grew to admire insects and their ability to find efficient ways to fly, despite their very inefficient and obtuse bodies. This would drive her to further her liquid metal experiments into merging it with carbon and organic material, creating insect-like appendages such as wings that would allow her to fly. But once at its peak, Yorozu was able to completely immerse herself in all of that constructed matter, conjuring a dense layer of what she calls insect armor. By replicating numerous bug biofunctions and making the most of her liquid metal, Yorozu's insect armor becomes a fulfilling way of achieving construction's peak offensive and defensive capabilities. Not only is Yorozu's striking power and durability significantly boosted, her speed is massively amped, allowing Yorozu to run circles around a 15-finger Sukuna and overwhelm the King of Curses in an onslaught of attacks, forcing him to exert effort finally and fight back for real. Hirozu is still also more than capable of mixing up her mid- and long-range liquid metal projectile attacks while fighting inside of her insect armor. Most of this is more than enough to separate her from the competition, but Hirozu's true masterpiece of creation hasn't even been discussed. True Sphere, the culmination of all of Hirozu's knowledge and research, is something Something said to be completely impossible in physics. This is because perfect spears have no contact area and therefore generate infinite pressure, essentially making anything touched by it cease to exist under the unimaginable weight invoked by its form. What makes this all the more devastating is True Sphere is almost always paired with Yorozu's domain expansion, threefold affliction. Inside the domain of mostly blank space and viscera, anything Yorozu has recreated will sure surely hit any opponents caught inside, meaning if True Sphere is placed within, its can't-miss attack will result in the opponent and Perfect Sphere touching. In fact, the only reason Sukuna survived is because Yorozu neglected to activate her innate technique out of confusion for him not attempting to counter or fight back. Regardless of how you feel about Yorozu's character or Gege's treatment of Sumiki, this is still a Hei and Era sorcerer that was more than able to hold herself against the 15-finger Sukuna. While you can of course argue Sukuna 
Kuna was holding back, and Malevolent Shrine would have changed her performance result in the fight, Yorozu's feats in her previous life, as well as what she's capable of with construction, far exceed anything shown from anyone ranked below. She also breaks her own limits in death by managing to recreate a curse tool, previously thought impossible, making Yorozu our top 5 culling game player. Now, I'm gonna catch a lot of flack for this, but I have to be completely unbiased in this ranking. With most of the stronger sorcerers in the culling game being reincarnated players, it just makes sense the number four culling game player would be the Vessel of Angel, Hano Karusu. Not thanks to any of her own merit, as this strictly comes from Angel's technique, but I digress. A young woman around the same age as Megami and Itadori, Hano Karusu was an orphan abandoned by her family as a child. She was never fostered though, at least least, at first, and ended up trapped with two other children, taken hostage by a cursed spirit who was twisted enough to believe it was actually raising its children. Hana would be fed meals and barely kept alive by the distorted entity, but she would sometimes find metal scraps or other foreign objects in her food due to the curse not truly understanding human life. Thankfully though, due to the efforts of Megami's divine dog at the age of six, on a walk with Gojo one day, child Megami happens to find Hana and the other two children from his white dog's sense of smell. Despite being separated and never meeting again until the events of the culling game, Hana always loved and adored the boy who saved her life, remembering his name and face even a decade later. Unlike the other reincarnated culling game players, and more similar to a relationship like Itadori and Sakuna, Hana Karusu and the cursed object Angel willingly coexist within the same body. Due to Angel's personal philosophy, which she refers to as God, she claims to completely denounce everything the culling game stands for, including the act of reincarnation as a whole. Angel simply took the trip through time and hoped she could somehow stop Kenjaku's plan and send all of the other incarnated players back to the shadow realm where they belong. It's for this reason that she chooses not to completely possess Hana's body as a vessel, on top of the fact that Angel Angel confirms this takeover process usually results in the host's essence being completely overwritten by the cursed object. Although Angel and Hana aren't that strong when it comes to physical fighting, her previously mentioned curse technique is what makes her so confident in that plan. Angel's curse technique is the ability to extinguish any and all curses, be they barriers, techniques, spirits, or other cursed objects. Named Jacob's Ladder, by summoning a trumpet conjured by pure light and chanting a brief incantation, Angel can create a large area of effect attack that can blanket an entire city within its maximum range. Any curse caught inside of this territory will immediately begin to disintegrate under God's light. At a power level so high, even the King of Curses, Sukuna himself, was wailing in pain from his very essence itself being eviscerated. Technique Extinguish was an ability that essentially broke the culling game in more ways than one. Not only were Hada and Angel able to cross between colonies freely and completely ignore the barrier your set. Reincarnated players, the biggest threat in the game, are the most vulnerable to the technique. In fact, Sakuna only survives this stunt due to Hana's infatuation with Megami, and Sakuna taking advantage of this fact to deceive her and cut the extinguishing process before completion. Long story short, this means every single heavy hitter on this list that was from a previous era is eliminated in a fight with Angel without any chance to retaliate. Not only is the distance Jacob's Ladder covers too wide for anyone to escape in time, it can be assumed Angel can use the technique without incantation in exchange for a smaller range of effect or less immediate results. And although Hana herself hasn't shown literally any feats in battle, Angel's origins, lying in the Heian era, will lend to her having some decent understanding of cursed energy reinforcement at the very least. She was a member of an elite pacification squad under the Abe clan in the most violent age of Jujutsu history. Dispatching weaklings shouldn't be too hard to argue. Hana and Angel were able to acquire points in the culling game, and with Angel's pacifism, this can at least be assumed to be from sorcerers. However, the two girls are clearly not fighters, and rely heavily on their overpowered technique to get by. It's hinted, even with this advantage, there were some reincarnated players she wouldn't even try alone, and we'll be getting into them later.
Using Kenjaku's words specifically, Higuruma Hiromi is the only sorcerer that was awakened for the culling game that is worth a single damn. Obviously, Kenjaku immediately eats those words, but we'll discuss why a bit later. To be completely honest with you, I couldn't decide who ranked above who when it came to Higuruma or Angel, simply because their techniques kind of contradict each other in certain ways. But based on Higuruma as a character and his growth throughout the series, it's safe to say if anyone had left a larger impact and actually has feats to back up their strength, it's him. Higuruma Hiromi, as mentioned before, is a newly awakened sorcerer that, at some point in time, had his brain marked by Kenjaku to unlock his innate technique. As of the current point in the manga, Higuruma had only been a sorcerer for about two months. And back when we see him fight against Yuji in the midst of the culling game, it had only been about two weeks since discovering his sorcery, and we already see him on par with a grade one sorcerer. The reason for this is, frankly, something that showed even in Higuruma's previous life and career as a lawyer. The man is a genius. He was able to master all the knowledge required of making the most of his abnormal curse technique in the same way he self-studied for the bar exam and became a man of the law. In his early days, Higuruma Hiromi had a reputation amongst his peers as always taking the most difficult cases possible and having some sort of savior complex. But this was far from the truth, as for as long as Higuruma could remember, if something didn't sit right with him, he just couldn't let it slide. This resulted in him constantly taking up arms against Japan's 99% conviction rate, fighting cases for clients Higuruma believed were wrongfully accused. No matter how many sleepless nights or countless hours Higuruma put into these cases, his clients were always doomed to fail. The odds of the system were always stacked against them. And eventually, a cycle started happening, where Higuruma would inspire the client to be hopeful, and when the innocent charge never comes, Higuruma's clients turn around and curse him for even trying to help. Some of them believing they would have been better off accepting their fate and not fighting a losing battle. The constant beatdown of the justice system and Higuruma's indomitable will to keep his eyes open in the face of injustice would take a major toll on the man's mental health. To the point after his brain had been altered to awaken his curse technique, Higuruma snapped and in his manic episode took matters into his own hands to judge those who had irresponsibly wielded the system against innocence. Disillusioned, Higuruma found comfort in the new social contract presented by the culling game, a rule system he felt would finally hold people accountable for the actions they took, and could change society for the better. Obviously, this was a lie Higuruma told himself, and he eventually does wake up from this darkness he submerges himself in, shown by the evolution Higuruma's curse technique undergoes throughout the story. Higuruma Hiromi's innate technique, similar to Akari Kenji, completely stems from his domain expansion, Deadly Sentencing. Because of this, Higuruma actually had to learn sorcery backwards, deconstructing his domain to decipher barrier techniques and follow this method to understand cursed energy control. Inside of Higuruma's domain, another entity emerges and shares the territory with its user. This being is a Shikigami known as Judge Man, a large black monster, only recognizable by the white mask on its face with at first completely stapled shut eyes to represent Lady Justice's blindfold. While deadly sentencing is active, all violence, including casting your own domain or anti-domain counter, is forbidden. Meaning, once trapped inside, you are bound by the conditions of the domain, and Higuruma always opens the fight with this attack. Much like your average court trial, the user Higuruma and his enemy are put behind podiums in order to judge the opponent for a random crime they've committed in their life. The crime Judge Man picks has no rhyme or reason, and to give an example, Higuruma's trial of Sukuna is the best. It's explained that because Sukuna committed multiple crimes in Shibuya, despite the massacre of thousands of people being his worst recent misdemeanor, we'll call it, Judge Man could select something much less heinous like property damage or trespassing somewhere in Shibuya no civilians are allowed. This condition truly only matters if Higuruma is attempting to try his opponent on a specific crime, but in most cases, with a random opponent, you won't know what all the crimes in question could be anyway, but it's still important to understand deadly sentencing as a whole. After picking a crime and charging an opponent, the enemy can plead their case and attempt to defend themselves in the court of law. Higuruma is also granted evidence by Judge Man to act as the prosecutor stand-in to further justify Judge Man giving a conviction. Higuruma fighting for a charge as opposed to against it is reflective of his mental state at the time, as later when he uses the domain against Sakuna, we see Higuruma 
Kuruma turn the tables and actually defend Yuji from the charge, embracing his true lawyer personality and keeping his eyes open. A trait we now see shared by Judge Man, whose left eye has been torn open as well. Regardless of the way Higuruma uses the ability, once Judge Man reaches a conviction, two outcomes are possible. The first is confiscation. When activated, Judge Man, upon finding the target guilty, strips them of their curse technique entirely. Once the domain is dispersed, while Higuruma is free to act and engage his opponent in battle, they will be completely debilitated and find it hard to fight back, as not only will the enemy's technique be rendered useless due to ingrained habits in most sorcerers, the loss of a technique almost always results in disruption of cursed energy control, meaning a target of deadly sentencing will also find it hard to reinforce their attacks or defend, taking nothing but critical damage from Higuruma's attacks. And thanks to the cursed weapon that is also a function of Higuruma's domain, Higuruma is able to take full advantage of an opponent's vulnerability, and if his 100 point total is anything to go by, he's completely capable of killing sorcerers with it. The gavel that Higuruma uses in court is actually a fully fledged shape-shifting curse tool that can become almost anything Higuruma needs at the time. Higuruma has enlarged the gavel into a giant mallet for critical sledgehammer attacks, or even turn the tool into a staff, a hook, or use it as a projectile thanks to its ability to teleport into either of Higuruma's hands from wherever it's located. Despite only being a sorcerer for two weeks, the man was able to keep up with the physical tank Yuji Itadori. Although, in his defense, he wasn't able to reinforce any of his body with cursed energy at the time, but as Higuruma continued to develop, his level as a sorcerer improved rapidly. The lawyer was able to completely recreate an advanced ability like domain amplification just by watching Gojo and Sukuna perform it on TV. He's also able to wield it at such a high rate it's comparable to Sukuna, considering it takes much concentration to maintain your technique and amplification interchangeably. The lawyer, when pressed by Sukuna to heal himself after having both of his arms removed, surprisingly was able to do exactly what Sukuna asked of him. On pure willpower alone, Hikaruma was able to use reverse curse technique at such an advanced level, he could regrow his arms back in moments. This rate of evolution stems completely from Higuruma's high intellect and innate potential, resembling Satoru Gojo almost in a way, just literally being someone who seems to be good at whatever the hell they touch. While all of this, combined with Higuruma's domain that can nullify curse techniques and energy reinforcement, the Sorcerer of Two Months is a surprisingly powerful grade one. His excellent rate of evolution makes him a serious threat to most players on the list just because of his insane adaptability to situations. I mean, this is someone that, although they lost, was still able to fight with and impress the king of curses of all people. But what truly makes Higuruma number three on the list is the final outcome that can come from Judge Man's convictions. For the most heinous of crimes, just like in real life, there is the ultimate punishment, and that's capital. Judge Man is able to charge a target with not just confiscation, but the death penalty as well. This means not only will a target be made almost defenseless, depending on the fighter, of course, but Higuruma's gavel will suddenly transform into a blade of pure light called the Executioner's Sword. And this new weapon has only one function, to carry out the death sentence. Upon one touch, legitimately any contact with his blade at all will kill you. And because the charge specifically targets a being by name, even if that body hit holds two souls, it will only be the accused who perishes. The Executioner's Sword is the icing on the cake that makes Higuruma one of the strongest sorcerers in the culling game. And frankly, he's justifiably very high ranked even without this guaranteed kill factor. One of the most beautiful things to me is that Higuruma was able to use his deadly sentencing one final time in a way that he always wanted to live his life, protecting someone who was wrongly accused and exploited by some other evil entity. It's only fair Higuruma fights for Yuji, as he represents everything Higuruma once originally stood for. He's also the one that awakened Higuruma from his mental break, and I'm glad he was able to finally look Itadori in the eyes one last time after redeeming himself against Sakura. One of the most exceptional culling game players that was able to accrue over 200 points and little to no time at all. Kashimo Hajime is a reincarnated player in the culling game that originates from the same era as Ishigori Ryu, about 400 years prior to current events. Kenjaku didn't approach Kashimo until well into his elderly years, and despite his body barely holding up, Kashimo was still capable of obliterating whole battlefields of opponents even without the use of his cursed 
technique. Originating from the past, violence between sorcerers, of course, ran rampant. But Kashimo was so powerful, he wandered the world in search of greater challenges and ultimately ended up depressed in his later life because he felt he never met that true challenge. This is the reason Kashimo decides to transcend time with Kenjaku. As the brain slips the dying old man a small glimmer of hope in the chance of meeting Ryomen Sakuna, who Kenjaku claims is the strongest sorcerer he has ever seen, even after 600 years have gone by. Kashimo's goals completely revolve around meeting Sakuna at this point, and getting the warrior death he feels he's deserved. Ironically enough, declining to meet Ishigori Ryu, who Kenjaku even mentions as a possible suitable opponent. I feel like Kashimo leaving the Date period not only deprived Ishigori of what would have been that satisfying fight he needed to rest peacefully, Kashimo, because of not being in his prime like we do see in the Culling game, may have actually lost to Ishigori and finally achieved his proper ending as well. It's interesting to think about how if all these sorcerers decided to make the most of their current life instead of hopping into a new one, things might have been alright. Given his mission and a brand new youthful vessel, Kashimo is no longer bound by the shackles of time and can make the most of his years of experience to become a top player in the culling game. The chaos Kashimo was able to invoke just on his own alone was enough to keep even Hanukarusu and Angel clear of Tokyo Colony 2. And the reason for this is the sheer overwhelming power Kashimo can bring to the table just with his bare hands and staff alone. As one of the strongest sorcerers who somehow made it to old age in an era of violence and war, Kashimo's cursed energy control is one of the most unique things in the series. Similar to Akari Kinji's shark skin effect or Itadori Yuji's divergent fist lag, Kashimo's cursed energy carries an electrical current almost, making every attack he lands have an intense secondary shocking effect that not only makes the hits impossible to block, they'll almost always result in stunning the enemy. And with an entire lifespan of combat experience, Kashimo was able to make the most of this passive ability thanks to being a master of close quarters combat. He is able to blitz a character like Panda and, assumedly, every other sorcerer he encountered to reach a 200 total point count. Considering Kashimo is a prideful warrior, he doubtfully fought any non-sorcerers. Kashimo's speed is enough to keep up with the jackpotted Hikari, and his bare punch is able to knock an entire shipping container into the air. Kashimo's durability is immense as well, considering he endures the entire fight with Akari and the massive explosion he induces with his cursed energy and still shows little to no damage or stamina loss. In fact, Kashimo's cursed energy reserves only reduced to zero in that fight because of falling in the water, and if that hadn't happened, he would have clearly outlasted Akari for perhaps a fourth jackpot. The most impressive thing is Kashimo is capable of wrecking this much havoc just in base form alone. To think that one of the strongest characters in the verse, Akari, was brought to death's door three different times times without a single use of Kashimo's ability. And the way that Kashimo was almost able to kill Hikari is even more lethal. As an extension of Kashimo's electrical curse property, he is exceptionally adept at separating the positive and negative charges of his energy. By using either his own attacks or strikes with his staff, Kashimo can quote unquote mark an enemy with his positive spark and then completely discharge the negative side, creating a reaction that summons a lightning bolt between the two points that is essentially a can't-miss attack that does not require the condition of a domain. The lightning bolt is just as fast as the element itself, and just as destructive, capable of obliterating any part of the body that's struck. Hikari loses an arm and his head almost implodes, but lower tier characters like Panda are reduced to bits and pieces, showing how massive the damage can be depending on where and how the lightning bolt strikes you. This makes every single attack that Kashimo lands have the potential to result in even more more lethal action, which, if the enemy is already stunned or reeling from the intense pain, makes getting a win much easier. And this is still neglecting any activation of Kashimo's curse technique. The reasons for not using which are because it results in the complete decay of Kashimo's entire body. And this one-time use factor has made Kashimo decide to save the technique for his battle against Sukuna. And Sukuna only. Kashimo's so dedicated to this, in fact, he would rather die to Hikari then use it against him. Kashimo's curse technique is called Mythical Beast Amber. Once released, Kashimo's body is immediately transformed and his cursed energy surrounds every limb and crevice. But this is not just armor. Kashimo's curse technique actually converts all of his flesh as a whole into energy, with all restrictions removed.
move, Kashimo can abuse the lightning aspect of his cursed energy to the maximum. And to the point, literally any phenomena in reality brought by electricity can be utilized by him. In layman's terms, what this means is Kashimo can do so much more now than simply shoot off lightning bolts. Kashimo is able to extend this electrical property outside of himself, creating a magnetic field that surrounds him and irradiates the physical objects around. After being corrupted by Kashimo's cursed energy at an atomic level, those items can be vaporized and cause massive explosions and damage to the surrounding area. We see Kashimo utilize this when he completely decimates the ground below Sukuna, and the King of Curses has to move out of the way. The area of effect or range of Kashimo's irradiation is unknown, although with proper charging or strategical building of energy, technically speaking, if all phenomena of electricity are at Kashimo's fingertips, he should be able to muster a nuclear level of damage with proper preparation. He can even release sonic booms from his mouth once his body is completely converted. Unfortunately, we don't really get to see too much of Kashimo's curse technique as Heianara Sukuna immediately dices him into pieces, but that does not change the fact that just on the premise of Kashimo's curse technique alone, the possibilities open up to him at an almost endless scale. And even though Kashimo doesn't have a domain expansion, the sorcerer does come equipped with anti-domain measures like Hollow Wicker Basket in order to ensure he doesn't lose ground in battle on that front either. So not only is Kashimo a force to be reckoned with even when he's holding himself back, the fact of the matter is, if Kashimo was to go all out with his technique at the sacrifice of his body, he rises to being one of the strongest sorcerers of all time, as frankly, not many people besides Heianara Sakuna would have been able to survive the attacks of Mythical Beast Amber, and I'm pretty sure Kashimo still had plenty left to show. If you're still confused about how all of this technique works, I did briefly summarize it just for the video here, so if you want a more in-depth explanation, I have a video that you can find right here on the card top right. Still, with what he did, it's easy to imply Kashimo casually reaches the second rank of culling game players, and despite suffering from the Jogo effect, I personally think Kashimo's ending was beautiful and well-deserved. Sukuna himself is right in one thing at least, and that's calling Kashimo greedy. The man was the most powerful sorcerer in his generation, and instead of relishing in that fact and enjoying his role, Kashimo chose to resent being strong because he couldn't share it with anybody else. Kashimo might have found closure in Ishigori Ryu and had a battle that may have satisfied both of their hunger. So it's no surprise to me that a character with such selfish desires as transcending time to fight a sorcerer that he literally knew nothing about would be biting way more off than they could chew and meet their end pretty quickly at the hands of the sorcerer they wanted so desperately to meet. Kashimo fought so long and hard to reach a warrior's death that he lost his way. And it only makes sense that instead of some grand, amazing fight like he was expecting, he's dealt with thoroughly and quickly. Frankly, just like Kenjaku told him he would be from the beginning. So no matter how you feel about Kashimo or his ending, as he gets his final flashback, the man smiles and is ultimately satisfied with meeting not only the pinnacle of sorcery, but dying at its hands. Kashimo, throughout it all, left a huge impression on Jujutsu Kaisen and its modern age, and I don't think anyone on this list can be argued to be stronger than him, except at least for the special case of sorcerer number one. The main event, the shining example of pure perfection in sorcery, and truly the most powerful fighter throughout the entire culling game. There was never any doubt, and it's honestly surprising if you didn't see this coming. Umehiko Takaba is the number one, and honestly, without joking, the strongest culling game player between all colonies. Throughout his whole life, even as a child, Takaba wanted nothing more than to be liked. This translated into a love of comedy, because it was a way for him to even make the bullies laugh. Being funny brought Takaba the attention he wanted, and even though he was constantly hiding behind a mask, it became something that Takaba cherished. Takaba's obsession with comedy, however, became quite toxic as he entered his older years. His self-driven personality and stark dedication to the career led him to becoming hard to work with. Takaba, in his opinion, was never able to meet anyone with the same care and soul as him, meaning he always argued and pushed away any quote-unquote partner that would come his way. 
Part of this stems mostly from Takaba always feeling like he needed to overcompensate for things his partner lacked, usually just making Takaba come off unfunny or that he was trying too hard. This slump followed him into his adult years, and ultimately, Takaba became a washed up comedian that, even late into his 30s, was never able to make it in the entertainment industry. To Takaba's credit, this never stopped him, but again, it's this will to never give up and need to succeed his way that led him down this path in the first place. It isn't until the culling game begins that Takaba is given true purpose, and despite all the chaos and how unordinary it is for society to devolve into a battle royale to the death, Humihiko Takaba thrives in this environment as one of the only still pro-violence comics remaining. Probably due to coming from an older, less politically correct generation, weirdly enough, Kenjaku seems to have no knowledge of Takaba whatsoever, and this is from a brain that claims to have extensive knowledge on every awakened or incarnated sorcerer, plus ways to track them. And yet, Takaba is not only an anomaly to Kenjaku, the comedian is easily able to sneak up on the brain without him noticing. That's enough for me to imply Takaba actually is not one of the non-sorcerers marked by Kenjaku to awaken a technique, and he's actually just a sorcerer who somehow wandered through life unregistered and never discovered by Jujutsu society. When you consider that not only does Fumihiko Takaba not understand his curse technique in the slightest, but also the way the ability works as a whole, it might not be that hard to believe Takaba went unnoticed for over 30 years. But before we talk about the inner workings of his ability, which is obviously the only reason Takaba ranks this high, I want to give the old head his dues as a reasonably seasoned combatant. As despite the culling game being Takaba's first experience with sorcerer battles, the way he's able to reinforce his attacks with cursed energy and output is quite impressive. Even Reggie Star, a sorcerer from the past with veteran experience, notes Takaba's surge in power as a dangerous trait and admits he's a powerful opponent. This exact dropkick that Reggie's commentating over is enough to shoot Hazanoki Iori through multiple buildings, and considering his curse technique nullifies almost all damage done to Takaba, it's not surprising why Megami, Reggie, and even Hazanoki himself would rather not battle a threat like Takaba. Without any more waffling, let's get into why Takaba is just so damn overpowered, and it's all because of his curse technique, cleverly named the Comedian, a power that is stated to rival Satoru Gojo himself, even without Takaba's understanding of it. And to Angel's point, she later mentioned in the story that frankly, it's probably better if Takaba never understands it because it may greatly affect its viability. Essentially, anything Takaba imagines or finds funny will happen. It's that simple. The comedian has the actual full-on ability to manipulate reality in any way Fumihiko Takaba sees fit. We see this come to light in Takaba's battle against Kenjaku, where as stated before, not only is every single attack that this ancient powerful sorcerer dishes out not affecting Takaba in the slightest, the brain is forced to participate in every single dumb simulation that runs through Takaba's mind. From small blips in reality, like Takaba imagining Kenjaku as Bandit Keith and making sunglasses and a bandana appear on his head, to fully developed and intricate movie or game show scenes that have multiple characters and layers to the story. And as stated before, regardless of their opponent's awareness of Takaba's ability, the comedian has such a strong hold on reality, it can even make a tactical opponent like Kenjaku forget they're supposed to be mid-battle when acting these simulations out. Kenjaku describes the way the comedian affects an opponent as soul resonance, meaning it's completely unavoidable through any reinforcement or barrier means. And because it can trick the opponent into participating in the nonsensical games, as the enemy continually takes damage from each of Takaba's slapstick attempts or routines, they're unable to get any chance of healing or even fighting back before they're moving on to the next scene. Even if they do somehow manage to fight back, Shoma Kenjaku summons a special grade curse spirit to help him fend Takaba off. The special grade gets immediately crushed by a spawning random truck and exercised on impact. So not only does the comedian remove any and all defense from an opponent, they are essentially trapped in an endless loop until they are drained of all stamina and life force. Takaba, whether due to a condition of the comedian or his own personality, is unable to land a killing blow with his ability, unfortunately. But considering Kenjaku was worried to let the fight continue, the threat of danger is still there. It was commonly theorized that domain expansion would be an easy way to avoid Takaba's nonsense. But seeing how Kenjaku was subjected to its full 
full effects, that can be called into question, as if an opponent is truly drawn into the immersive simulation to the point they can't even retaliate, they might not even be able to cast Domain to counter. Now, you can make an argument Kenjaku was just trying to conserve energy in the case Yuta or Maki were up next to fight, but it's notable Kenjaku generally thought he might lose, and didn't choose to just expand his domain and end the fight there. Regardless, it is a fact to say, any opposing player would still have a hard time fighting back. And realistically, it seems the only way to defeat Takuba's omnipotence is by besting him at his own game, as shown when Kenjaku breaks down Takuba's comedy and makes him doubt his own funniness, proving the technique's effectiveness is tied to Takuba's confidence and complete lack of self-awareness. The damage nullification is removed, the Takuba starts to question himself and makes him vulnerable to outside attacks. And on top of this, as we see later, by fulfilling Takuba's dreams of comedy and making him feel like the show is over, the curse technique will end. It also seems like Takuba accepts loss if this is the case. And considering that all of this fighting and violence is, at the end of the day, a big joke to Takuba, it makes sense this would be the case. Ironically enough, what ended up fulfilling Takuba was someone stepping in to play the funny man and allowing Takuba himself to step back as the straight guy in the routine, which Kenjaku played into perfectly, finally removing any need for Takuba to overcompensate for himself. But considering not a single character on this list has the knowledge or even understanding of comedy that they'd be able to destable Takuba's confidence or bring his dream to fulfillment, his reality bending abilities most likely trounce everyone. It requires someone who can talk to Takuba on a similar wavelength, ironically this makes sense due to the comedian's relation to soul resonance in general, to even reach past his wall of self-confidence. As Hazanoki Iori, despite rejecting everything Takuba was cooking, was utterly useless against the comedian, and this is before Takuba was fully realized and able to maximize the output of his technique. In conclusion, the statement that Takuba may be able to rival Gojo Satoru with his reality bending, bringing imagination to life, overpowered as hell curse technique, is fully backed by what we've seen of him in Jujutsu Kaisen, and it's pretty undebatable even that Fumihiko Takuba is the number one culling game player. And that's all there is to say. If you disagree with any of my placements or want to add any additional things I may have forgotten, please feel free to leave a comment. I appreciate you all very much if you made it this far to the end of the video, and if you haven't already, make sure you please hit that like button for me. Also, subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this, check out my second channel for more uploads, and click an end screen video if you want to continue your binge. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.